The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Berliner. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy was the first president to visit West Berlin since the establishment of the Berlin Wall that divided Allied and Soviet-controlled portions of the city. Kennedy told the crowd at Rudolf Wilde Platz that America would stand with Germany and the free world, a policy that would be passed down from administration to administration until the end of the Cold War almost 30 years later. I'm Matt Porter, and up next we'll examine the U.S. relationship to Berlin and the overall picture of JFK's Cold War legacy in Let Us Begin, Episode 3, The Hour of Maximum Danger. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. Three years before President Kennedy took office, Americans and their sense of security changed forever. The successful launch of the Soviet satellite Sputnik into space suddenly made the world a lot smaller and America a lot more vulnerable to attack. Historian and author Tim Naftali explains how Sputnik changed Americans' sense of security. If you had put a nuclear warhead Uh, on the rocket that was used to power Sputnik into space, you could presumably attack New York or Washington, D.C. So the Soviets with Sputnik were not simply the first to put a satellite into space, but they were demonstrating to the world that they had the capability of of, uh, launching a, a nuclear missile strike on the United States. The shifting paradigm would become a major issue in the 1960 election when Senator John F. Kennedy challenged Vice President Richard Nixon. In the 1960 presidential debates, candidate Kennedy took Vice President Richard Nixon and the Eisenhower administration to task for allowing the U.S. to fall behind the Soviet Union when it came to missile security. But we were far stronger relative to the communists five years ago. And what is of great concern is that the balance of power is in danger of moving with them. They made a breakthrough in missiles. And by 1961, 2, and 3, they will be outnumbering us in missiles. I'm not as confident as he is that we will be the strongest military power by 1963. The suspected deficiency in missiles, or missile gap, would become a major part of the campaign. And that was a fear that was shared by all the Democratic candidates. Although Richard Nixon, who would be the Republican nominee, and President Eisenhower did not believe that there was a missile gap, even though the intelligence was not strong enough to eliminate a worst case scenario. Eisenhower in particular believed that this was a a fanciful concern. He did not actually think the Soviets were building that many missiles, but he couldn't prove a negative. In a surprising twist, after the election, President Kennedy would receive definitive intelligence about the missile gap. And what did they find? They found that the Soviets had only 10 ICBMs deployed in 1961, whereas the United States was concerned that they would have well over 100. And the U.S. had 172 deployed. So there was a missile gap, but it favored the United States rather than the Soviet Union. From the moment John F. Kennedy took office, the Cold War would be an ever-present issue for the new president. But neither can two great and powerful groups of nations take comfort from our present course, both sides overburdened by the cost of modern weapons, both rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom, yet both racing to alter that uncertain balance of terror 
that stays the hand of mankind's final war. During the early part of President Kennedy's time in office, there were two distinct Kennedys, according to Naftali. The Kennedy, who spoke publicly to the world, felt he needed to take a strong position on the Soviet Union and any form of communist expansion. However, the Kennedy inside the White House, who met with his advisors on a regular basis, had a much more nuanced view of the Cold War and was deeply concerned with conflicts that could cause an escalation between the two countries. So on the one hand, Kennedy gave the American people what he thought the American people wanted to hear, which is we're going to be tough on the Soviets. We're going to be second to none in our military power, especially our our strategic nuclear power. The U.S. position under Kennedy was to uh, maintain U.S. nuclear superiority. That never changed under Kennedy. That was the policy of the United States to be not equal with the Soviets, but superior to the Soviets in nuclear power. That was the public pronouncement. Behind the scenes, President Kennedy worried about nuclear danger. He was apparently impressed in a negative way uh, when he learned about the, the, the plan for a U.S. response to a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. He, he had a sense that there was this, this machine that, was, that would operate that uh, uh, that had these triggers that might might go off accidentally. The idea that a nuclear war could begin outside of the president's control was a deeply troubling thought for the president. He worried about accidental war. He he worried about a some colonel or lieutenant colonel somewhere in you know the, in NATO's world that would make a mistake. And that mistake, or even a Soviet uh, officer who might make a mistake, and that mistake might lead to the unauthorized detonation of a nuclear device, which would set in motion this doomsday machine. In this way, Naftali says Kennedy was extremely careful, possibly to a fault, when conducting military operations that could conflict with the Soviets. His biggest failure came early in his presidency in April 1961. The president agreed to support an invasion at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba by rebel forces seeking to overthrow Cuban leader Fidel Castro. The invasion was initially devised under President Eisenhower's administration. However, in an effort to give the U.S. a deniability, Kennedy restricted U.S. participation in the operation substantially, including providing significantly less naval and air support. Tim Naftali says Kennedy wasn't necessarily concerned that operations in Cuba would start an all-out war, but he explains it could have affected U.S. interests in Southeast Asia, where Kennedy's diplomats were negotiating with the Soviets. And, and Kennedy's way of achieving this was, was asking the CIA and the military to keep the Bay of Pigs as deniable a U.S. operation as possible. There was no way to achieve military success in Cuba with those instructions. Now, we'll, we'll never know if the Bay of Pigs with U.S. naval support and air support, which is what the CIA and the Joint Chiefs expected would happen, would have succeeded in overthrowing Castro. We'll never know that. What was clear is that John F. Kennedy's decisions to restrict elements of the plan killed it. Of course, the biggest Cold War challenge came in the fall of 1962 during the 13-day Cuban Missile Crisis. It was during that moment when Soviet nuclear missiles were revealed to be on the island of Cuba that the president faced his greatest test. The U.S. threw up a steel fence prepared to stop any vessel carrying materials of war. The United States went to the U.N. Security Council for a resolution calling for a withdrawal of all offensive weapons from Cuba. A full accounting of the entire Cuban Missile Crisis can be heard in our podcast series, Atomic Gambit, and we encourage you to listen to it. In terms of the history of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis and JFK's successful navigation of it would be a turning point in how the president addressed the threat from the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. I call upon him further to abandon this course of world domination and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. Our goal is not the victory of might, 
but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. For the first time, Kennedy had the opportunity to address the Cold War in public as he saw it in private, without the fear of being labeled soft. I believe the American people saw for the first time the fragility of the international system in a way that I think Kennedy already understood. As we discussed in our last episode, President Kennedy's new public focus on peace and how to avoid a situation like the Cuban Missile Crisis marked a turning point in Soviet and U.S. relations. Today, the expenditure of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need them is essential to the keeping of peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles, which can only destroy and never create, is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring peace. I speak of peace, therefore, as the necessary rational end of rational men. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war, and frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. President Kennedy's public rhetoric about the Soviets in 1963 created space for future presidents to seek coexistence with Moscow. I believe that's one of the most important achievements of the short detente that Kennedy lived to see with Moscow. And one of his final Cold War speeches came at Rudolf Wilde Platz in West Berlin in June 1963. Berlin was the focal point for both countries during the Cold War from the end of World War II through the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. At that moment in 1963, Kennedy was set to address the people of West Berlin less than two years after the Soviets erected a wall dividing the city from Soviet-controlled East Berlin. And Berlin was a symbol of the Allied victory. The Soviets, who lost far more people destroying the Nazis than the West did, also saw Berlin as a symbol of victory over Hitler. So there was also an an emotional attachment to Berlin. And the idea of losing Berlin to the Soviets undermined a sense of achievement that many World War II veterans had. Standing in West Berlin, looking out at the wall and the dividing line between the two cities, Kennedy crafted a short speech, less than 10 minutes long, that continues to resonate as one of the most defining speeches of the entire Cold War. One one element of Kennedy's genius was he understood public pronouncement. He understood how to create political theater in a positive way. He understood better than almost any modern president the power of aspirational rhetoric. And 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 he cared deeply about phrasing. Let's not forget Kennedy thought for some time that he might become a journalist. He loved words. And he and he was a good editor. John F. Kennedy, when thinking about what to say at Berlin, in Berlin, thought about this concept of from from his reading of of classical history of the idea of the um, citizen of Rome, civis Romanus sum, which is the idea in the Roman Empire of the power of Roman citizenship, sort of unifying certainly the elites of of the Roman Empire. And he had used this concept uh, in the South to talk about the power of being an American citizen. I am, there is nothing better in this era than to be than to be able to say I am a citizen of the United States, and he wanted to use that concept, flip it on its head, and give a sense that um, that West Berliners could rely on, if you will, the the American Empire, the American defense community, to defend them, and so he flips it by not saying to not asking Berliners to say we are citizens of the United States, but he wanted them to know I, John F. Kennedy, 
am a citizen of Berlin. I feel an emotional connection to you. And I will think about your defense the way any citizen of any city would think about defense. It's it, He had flipped a concept that he liked to use and he liked to think about on its head. There are many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't. What is the great issue between the free world and the communist world? Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say, there are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. And there are even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Lost the not Berlin in common. Let them And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. When all are free, then we look and look forward to that day when this city will be joined as one and this country and this great continent of Europe in a peaceful and hopeful globe. When that day finally comes, as it will, the people of West Berlin can take sober satisfaction in the fact that they were in the front lines. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. For historian Tim Naftali, JFK's speech was a reminder to the people of West Berlin that they would not be forgotten. And it was also a message to the rest of the newly formed NATO alliance that they had a defender in the United States. And so for Kennedy, the summer of 63 was not just an opportunity to remind the world that West Berlin mattered. The the defense of West Berlin's freedom was a vital interest of the United States. He also wanted to make clear to West Berliners, look, the wall is an affront to liberty. It is offensive. It is ugly. We are still behind you. Unfortunately, President Kennedy would live only four months more after his speech in West Berlin. The president would leave an incomplete legacy when it came to combating the Soviet Union and expansion of communism. Joining me now to discuss President Kennedy and the Cold War legacy he left behind for future administrations is Tom Nichols. Tom is a staff writer at The Atlantic, professor emeritus of national security affairs at the Naval War College, and a leading expert of Cold War history. Tom, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Matt. Good to be back. Tom, President Kennedy had a short administration, but oversaw it at pivotal moments in the Cold War from the Cuban Missile Crisis to the building of the Berlin Wall. Can you discuss a little bit how President Kennedy's administration may have served as a foundation for the U.S. Cold War diplomacy that would come after his administration? The Kennedy administration uh, faced an unusual period in the Cold War when the Soviet Union was uh, finally sorting out its own leadership issues. Stalin, when Kennedy came into office, Stalin had been dead for seven years, eight years. But there had been a lot of um, jockeying and movement inside the Soviet leadership in those years while Eisenhower was president. And Kennedy now faced a whole, not entirely a different world, but a wholly different kind of Soviet movement that was trying to break out of the the moribund 50s. And and many of Stalin's mistakes, which, of course, is why Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, gives us a secret speech denouncing Stalin. And you get this much more muscular approach to Berlin, to the third world, what was called the third world then, what to 
uh, the military competition with the United States. And in part, I think this happens because Khrushchev believed that he could face down Kennedy, that he was tougher than Kennedy, he was older than Kennedy, and that he had political capital uh, to start doing things that to, to return to that kind of confrontational, maybe late 40s, early 50s attitude that had characterized Soviet foreign policy in the late Stalin period. But there was also an opportunity because Khrushchev didn't want World War III. He wasn't Stalin. He wanted more uh, a more peaceful competition with the West. And so there was a kind of schizophrenic approach here that from the Soviets of putting missiles in Cuba and you know, sending tanks up to the Berlin Wall, but also trying to talk about things like peaceful coexistence. So it was, a, it was a very difficult time for American foreign policy in general. And with a, uh, I should add one other thing. Of course, the wild card in China, as uh, the the Sino-Soviet alliance uh, deteriorates, and during the Kennedy administration, it becomes clear that China is going to become a nuclear power. So there was a lot on there was a lot on Kennedy's plate. Definitely. And, you know, you mentioned how the Soviet Union had this sort of schizophrenic situation going on. What was their identity? And on the United States side, there was also sort of these two different identities, right? President Kennedy, before he took office, campaigned that, you know, the Eisenhower was too soft on communism, too soft on the Soviet Union, wasn't doing enough. And you had sort of this early during his early periods, this attitude that the United States needs to be strong, um, needs to have the strong military buildup. That's the only way you can win. But then, you know, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world was taken to the brink, as many people say, maybe that thinking started to change. And we got to JFK's strategy of peace speech by the end of his administration at American University. Do you want to discuss on the American side how those two attitudes conflicted and how maybe Kennedy started to change? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that <clears throat> the change entirely happens after Cuba. I think it probably happens as it happens to every president on day one. The accusations that Kennedy made, you know, looking back now historically, you know, the, the accusations that Kennedy made against Eisenhower, you know, just being not being <laughs> big enough on defense almost seem <clears throat> comical and shallow. And in part, you know, Kennedy was. Um, not a, as a young congressman, Kennedy was not a particularly deep thinker. He was callow. And the question that I think a lot of people had about him was, was he going to rise to the job? And um, from the moment he arrived, I mean, the thing we haven't talked about, of course, is the Bay of Pigs. From the moment he arrived, he, I think he realized that there was a lot more going on. Again, as every president does, every president says a lot of things in front of the faithful, in front in parking lots and at rallies and so on. And then they get that briefing on their first day and they realize, I always think of that as the day where every candidate has a lot more respect for his predecessor. And I think um, you see this, by the way, when Kennedy and Eisenhower talked during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's a lot of respect between them. So I think Kennedy came in and realized that, you know, whatever you might say during a political campaign, there was... It was a pretty complex, he was up against a lot of pretty complicated problems. But America itself was, you know, happy with the with um, the economics of the 1950s. We were, you know, going through our period of post-war manufacturing boom. There's a reason that, you know, Eisenhower won two terms. Um, there's a reason Nixon lost that probably had more to do with Nixon uh, than it did with peace and prosperity. But um, there, there was also there were also a lot of challenges in the United States in the Cold War. We were claiming to be the beacon of freedom and democracy, but we had not yet even begun to complete or, or, or really embark on our own civil rights revolution. We still, you know, still an America where women had to get their husband's permission to have a car loan. So, you know, we we faced a lot of internal challenges as well. And and I think Kennedy ran for office and. My my colleague Steve Knott, who's written a recent reappreciation of Kennedy, his book has a lot more to say about this. But I think Kennedy ran um, maybe without really understanding the depth of a lot of those problems, both at home and abroad. But he but he ended up being confronted with them almost instantly. Mm. So here you have a president who give goes to Berlin in 1963, 60 years ago, uh, which is about two years after the completion of the Berlin Wall and gives that speech, the Ich Ben Ein Berliner speech. 
And then when you think going forward, several presidents later, Reagan gives his uh, tear down this wall speech about two years before the wall comes down. For you, who's been able to see the whole spectrum, what do you think about both those speeches, what each is trying to say? And do you think Kennedy's speech earlier had any influence on Reagan 35 years later? I, I, I don't know what the direct impact of the, <clears throat> the Kennedy Berliner speech was. We, we know that when Reagan wrote the tear down this wall line, we know that that's actually his line because his speechwriters and embassy bond kept trying to take it out. <laughs> so if, if Reagan was thinking of his predecessors, um, it's very possible he was thinking of Kennedy because he was the one who kept putting that line back into the speech. I think what Kennedy did was to really mark Berlin as a place where the West was going to make a stand. There had been crises in the 50s over Berlin. The Soviets would, the, the way the Soviets would make a run at this is to say, well, we're going to com- conclude a separate peace treaty with Berlin, excuse me, with the uh, Germans, the East Germans, whom we didn't recognize. Remember that Berlin and, as far as we're concerned, the Eastern sector are still under uh, the Allied Four Power Agreements. Uh, we don't recognize the German Democratic Republic, short lived though it was, until 1971. And so by going to Berlin, not just in 1963, but even with the very forceful approach to the Berlin crisis of October 1961, where Soviet American tanks faced each other at Checkpoint Charlie, I think Kennedy put Berlin right at the center of the Cold War as as a symbol. Now, it was also it was a symbol also because if World War Three broke out, it was going to break out at Checkpoint Charlie and everyone knew it. That would be the first place, the first thing that would happen, no matter what happened elsewhere in the world, the Soviets would kind of seize the the exposed nerve of Berlin and and um, work outward from there. But to, for an American president to go and even in his clumsy German to say, I am a citizen of this city, all free men are citizens of this city, I think um, set set the tone for years to come about the Berlin Wall at not because we did end up recognizing the division of Berlin. We recognized the division of Germany, but we never really accepted it as a morally legitimate. We always treated the the Berlin Wall as this kind of morally gruesome stain. And um, I think Kennedy really set the tone for that. And given that, how did other presidents take the Cold War reigns after Kennedy, who maybe were more similar to his core beliefs, maybe were there presidents who stepped um, in a different direction uh, after Kennedy? Well, it's interesting to, especially to compare Johnson and Nixon. Johnson, the the Johnson administration, that period is, uh, despite the scare, you had mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis, despite the scare we all put into each other after 1962, um, it's a pretty frosty relationship with the Soviets through the rest of the 60s, in part because of Johnson's escalation in Vietnam. Um, in fact, we now know from Soviet memoirs that some of the hardliners in the Soviet military came to the Politburo, to the Soviet leadership, and said in 1965, and said, you know, we should squeeze Berlin um, for what they're doing in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean, and especially bombing in, in Vietnam. Fortunately, the Soviet leadership uh, declined that invitation to World War III. At the, um, but, but the Johnson administration did try to build on at least some of the momentum from Cuba to talk about arms control, and the Soviets just stiff-armed him. They, they just straight up rebuffed him. The infamous meeting at Glassboro in 1967, where um, Johnson tried to get the Soviets to sign on to abandoning defenses and to um, except mutual assured destruction, you know, as a reality that didn't go very well. Um, the Nixon administration, in in a, in a way, is actually more accommodating of the Soviet Union than the Kennedy administration was. But it's also a different environment. The Soviets knew Kent Nixon; they referred to him. Um, one of their favorite words was "dielavoy," meaning businesslike. They, you know, that Nixon's. Nixon's an SLB, but we can deal with him. We get him. We understand him. And Nixon gave them a lot of things they wanted in terms of 
recognition as an equal, recognizing the GDR, recognizing borders in Europe, um, for example, that Kennedy simply could not have done in, say, 1961 or 1962. But I think where you, you start to see something more like the Kennedy legacy, if there, if insofar as Kennedy set this moral tone in places like Berlin, you see it picked up again, strangely enough, both by Jimmy Carter and by Ronald Reagan, who in their approach um, were both moralists, much much like Kennedy was in his speeches. And Kennedy gave very, you know, Sorensen was a great speechwriter, and Kennedy gave these very fiery speeches about the, the moral imperative of the Cold War. Carter did the same, at least where human rights were concerned, but muddied his own message because of he was pursuing multiple directions at once and it and it wasn't as clear but he he clearly treated what was happening within the soviet union as a moral problem as did ronald reagan who of course the apotheosis of that is an empire of evil in march of 1983 so there is a through line there that i think and i think people should you know we we have a tendency to look back at the cold war i think as partisans and say Democrats did this and Republicans did that. But there is a through line for all of these presidents, from Kennedy to Johnson, even to Nixon and his realpolitik, that there is a kind of a moral through line here that um, the Soviet Union, you know, about the about the moral quality of the Cold War. Um, some of that gets submerged under Nixon and Kissinger, who treat it as kind of a problem to be managed. It gets muddied again by Carter, who is trying to reduce arms, but strip the bark off the Soviets for human rights issues at the same time. And of course, by Ronald Reagan, who says and wants to avoid World War III while using rhetoric that brings us closer to World War III. But there, there is a consistency there that I think um, begins in the late 50s and early 60s, and, and that's given very sharp definition by Kennedy in many of his speeches. It's interesting just to hear the connections between all of them, um, all these leaders who had to deal with the same problem. And now I just want to take a few questions uh, into today. The Soviet Union is no more. Uh, but of course, now with President Putin um, leading Russia and the invasion of Ukraine, which is now the largest land war in Europe since World War II, what do you think today's diplomats and politicians can learn from the lessons of Kennedy and the Cold War as they're now embroiled in this conflict with Russia and Ukraine? Well, you know, it's interesting. Joe Biden is an old school, you know, product of the Cold War. <clears throat> and I would say that he is very much in that tradition from the 1950s through to the 1980s of saying, of drawing a very hard line rhetorically and making clear what's at stake here. In fact, Joe Biden being Joe Biden, he's been intemperate on occasions. I've even written and called him out for um, you know, getting over his skis a few times, um, but that he has made this very much a, a matter of international order and a moral imperative, and yet is carefully calibrating his responses to avoid a larger conflict, which you can call that, I suppose you can call that Nixonian or Kennedy-esque. What I would call it is part of the great tradition of American Cold War presidents who, working with experts and diplomats and advisors calibrate their response. Not not always well, you know, presidents make mistakes, but I think successfully enough to keep the peace while advancing American and um, allied values and interests, while at the same time making those speeches and making the case. And I think if I have one criticism of Joe Biden, it's that he has yet to to step forward and give that one big, you know, speech I don't expect him to go to Kiev and say, you know, I'm a citizen of Kiev, but um, he has, I think, in pieces made the case that this is about the rules based order. This is about crimes against humanity. This is this whole conflict is very much about the kind of things that the Western alliance was created to defend the international order against. And I think that is part of a tradition that goes all the way back to JFK and and even to Eisenhower. But again, I think it's JFK's rhetoric, particularly in his inaugural and then in several speeches about Berlin, that, that really makes that clear. And, you know, thinking about what Biden has to deal with, uh, whereas in 1960, there were two nuclear superpowers facing off against each other. 
today, you know, yes, Russia is a threat, but, you know, there are other concerns regarding China, South China Sea, North Korea, Iran, potentially other players um, that could emerge. How do lessons from the Kennedy administration maybe particularly be used um, in today's multilateral conflict with, you know, multiple nations that could have nuclear weapons or potentially cause a large conflict? No, one of the um, <clears throat> one of the things that always kind of makes me crazy during these discussions about dealing with Ukraine is when people say, well, you know, this is a new kind of problem because we have to deal with China as well. And if you go back to 1961, when Kennedy takes office, that's only eight years after the end of the Korean War. I mean, we have a an alliance in NATO that fully expects <clears throat> that if the Soviet Union attacks, we will lose. NATO in 1961 had no chance of defeating the Soviet Union in a conventional war um, without the use of nuclear weapons. But it was only eight years after hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops had come pouring over the border into Korea and and al U.S. and allied forces had actually been fighting with the Chinese. You know, this is not the first time a president has had to juggle two dangerous opponents on, in, on two sides of the world. And, you know, I think um, we lose sight of that fact sometimes. And we lose sight of the fact that we can, in fact, walk and chew gum. And that for 75 years, we've been pretty good at creating alliances and using diplomacy and deploying, you know, military, uh, a, a military presence around the world that has kept us um, safe. And I, I, you know, if I were Joe Biden, I, I'd, I'd probably be losing my patience. <clears throat> with those kinds of arguments, because, you know, when people say, well, this time we have this problem, in, you know, on the border in Europe, but but it's different because of China. Well, and it, to me, it doesn't look that different than anything we've been dealing with for, uh, you know, for 70 years. Well, you mentioned NATO. And so I'm going to ask another quick question on that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we saw that Ukraine wants to be a member of NATO as fast as possible. Other countries who had not wanted to be part of NATO now asking to be part of NATO, Sweden, for example. What do you think about the role of NATO today in this conflict compared to, you know, NATO, which was a much younger organization um, back in the 1960s? You know, it's an interesting question because NATO in the 60s was a was an organization that was formed in, in almost as an emergency measure. If you think about it, NATO was formed in 1949, one of the worst years of the Cold War. It is the Annus Horribilis of the Cold War, when um, you know the Chinese communists win their civil war, the Soviet Union explodes a bomb. We're just months away from the the Koreans and the North Koreans invading South Korea, and, and NATO is put together by a group of countries in Europe and North America, saying. We, you know, we have to band together to make it clear that the Soviet Union, which has many more men under arms at that point, you know, and outnumbers the West, that um, that they, that if they decide to invade Europe, they're going to have to fight all of us, even if we lose. I think the difference now is that the the script has been flipped. NATO is the most powerful alliance in the history of mankind. It is a remarkable achievement. Thirty two nations. I, I'm. 62 years old. If you had told me when I was in college in the 80s, for example, or graduate school, that Finland and Sweden, two of the most capable powers in Northern Europe, would be uh, members of NATO, I would have laughed. And so Biden has um, one big advantage, which is that the Russians are facing a NATO that could not. It's actually the opposite problem of the 60s. There is no possibility for Russia to defeat NATO without nuclear weapons. That's a very strong deterrent uh, against the Russians, it, that that NATO is so immensely conventionally powerful at this point. Uh, so it's a very different kind of line. So if you look back into the 1960s and even into the 1970s, when you had, you know, I mean, in 1966, France kicks NATO, uh, NATO headquarters out of Paris. Um, the Greeks and the Turks actually fight a war while they're NATO allies. It's a very different alliance today. It has its own problems. Countries such as Turkey and Hungary, you know, whose values seem don't seem to be as aligned with the rest of NATO as uh, they might have been in the old days. But again, you know, NATO was a fractious, difficult 
organization back in 1960 as well. So I think it, it's a remarkable difference in that sense that, you know, Kennedy couldn't really rely on NATO for very much in 1961. In fact, everything he has to work on with NATO is about getting NATO to the point where it's a credible military force. Biden is dealing with Russia where NATO is a immensely capable military force of nearly a billion people, the most wealthy countries in the world, the highest level of military technology. It is it is really a remarkable amount of distance covered for the alliance. This was not the direction NATO has been heading for the past 20 years. The person who really created the new NATO and gave it a sense of purpose and helped it to speed toward that enlargement is Vladimir Putin. Hmm. It's the president of Russia. By pursuing policies that broke down old prohibitions and reluctances and convinced, again, you know, convinced tr famously neutral Sweden to seek admission to um, an international military alliance. So, you know, I, uh, while it's, while Biden is the beneficiary, it would be wrong to, to argue that Biden or anybody else in, uh, in the West really created this. The person who really made this happen was Vladimir Putin and his, and his aggressive and hostile policies. Credit where credit is due. Nothing like a large crisis to band people together on one side. Absolutely. Thinking back to 60 years ago and where we were with the passing of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the newly invoked strategy of peace from President Kennedy, but then also um, at the end of that year, a devastating blow with President Kennedy's assassination. Do you think we've made substantial progress when it comes to nuclear diplomacy? And I know this could be a different answer 10 years ago or are you concerned there's a backslide into a potentially new cold war or something with even higher stakes which is hard to believe i'm going to give you that foggy academic answer and say that i actually think both of those things are true we have made since the 1960s immense progress you know in 1967 the u.s nuclear inventory hit something like 32,000 nuclear weapons the strategic air command was uh, just creating target maps that had you know, 40,000 targets on them. I mean, the whole the whole business was uh, completely out of control. And of course, the Soviets were doing the same. They had something like 20,000 nuclear weapons. And um, today, the United States and Russia, by treaty, have 15, roughly 1,500 weapons pointed at each other. Now, that's a lot of weapons and enough to pretty much snuff out a, a lot of life in the Northern Hemisphere. But uh, the days where we were, were expecting tens of thousands of strikes where, you know, we had, there was a 1990, mid-1990s expose, I shouldn't say expose, but a, but a review of this um, nuclear issues where it was pointed out that even Dick Cheney was appalled by our nuclear targeting where we were going to put 500 uh, weapons on Moscow you know, 30, 40, 60 at a time on radar sites because we simply had created so many weapons. So that is distinct progress that we have now by treaty gone from tens of thousands to thousands to 1,500. The problem is that we also have a, a much more unstable world with at least 10 demonstrated nuclear powers, including South Africa, which has been renounced. But probably nine active nuclear powers at this point. And, you know, that's the former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry has made the point that he actually thinks the use of a nuclear weapon, if not nuclear war, which might be a different matter, but a nuclear device somewhere could be more likely now than it was during the Cold War because, of course, of the rigid bipolarity of the Cold War. I think there's also been a kind of Cold War backsliding with Putin and the Russian regime basically just losing its mind and deciding to embark on a war of conquest in Ukraine, which has really thrown us back to the old Cold War nuclear threats. You know, about the first thing Putin did was put claim, at least, to put all of Russian nuclear forces on a special alert. And he's made these barely veiled threats about, you know, all measures that we could take if we are interfered with, et cetera, et cetera, um, which really is a kind of throwback to the 70s or the 80s. And, and and even earlier. So we've made a lot of progress. We've, again, going back to, you know, if you would talk to me as a young man and said to me, say, perhaps in 1982 or 83, listen, by the time 
you know, by 2023, 40 years from now, we are going to have a fraction of these these uh, inventories. I, I would have just laughed. I would have said it's just not possible. You can't build down from, you know, 20,000 strategic weapons to 1,500. But yeah, we did it. And that is an amazing thing to think about. And just hopefully things continue can move in that direction over time. Uh, the last question I want to ask, again, takes us back to what JFK left behind for other presidents. What would you say would be a blueprint or outline for peace and diplomacy that President Kennedy may have left behind for future presidents? Well, <clears throat> it was such a brief presidency. And frankly, you know, the, the Kennedy administration was not some you know, glorious string of unbroken foreign policy successes. I mean, it begins with a gigantic foreign policy disaster at the Bay of Pigs. I would argue that Cuba is the is the event that leaves behind the reminder to be creative uh, during a crisis, to find to to use the things America is good at, whether it's technology or in 1962 it was naval power, to find a way out of simply resorting to threats and the blunt hammer of military force. Uh, because I think that is the real achievement of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That you know the initial uh, response to the to the Soviet missile deployment is Kennedy's advisors tell them they just have to go. We're going to have to take them out. By of course the Army and the Marines wanted to do it on the ground. The Air Force wanted to do it from the air because that's how institutions work. But finding more creative ways to communicate to come up with measures short of war, I think, is is the template. And that's why we keep studying it. That's why, you know, every few years there are, we revisit the Cuban Missile Crisis because it was an incredibly dangerous moment. And yet we and the Soviets both found our way out of it. And, uh, you know, maybe that's one sliver of hope for that future presidents were able to look back on and say, however bad things get, we got out of that one. And the, that's one of the reasons that that crisis is one of the most studied in history. But as for a larger roadmap, I think the the optimism of the Kennedy administration is something that I think other presidents have wanted to capture. I mean, in that, I would say there's actually a, a, a through line again or a parallel between the bear any, you know, the inaugural, the Kennedy inaugural, bear any burden, pay any price uh, through line to the the you know, the Reaganite rhetoric of city on a hill. Now, obviously very different foreign policies, but more alike than dissimilar, at least in that approach to the Cold War. And I think that that kind of moral standpoint is the one that helps see us through right to the end. Well, Tom, thank you so much for taking your time today to sit down with us and talk about this. Appreciate your expertise as always. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the third episode of our special series, Let Us Begin, President Candy's White House 60 Years Later. In our next two episodes, we turn our focus to Ireland, to JFK's homecoming as the descendant of Irish immigrants. This is not the land of my birth, but it's a land uh, for which I hold the greatest affection. And I certainly will come back in the springtime. Thank you. While President Candy would not fulfill his promise, the visit left a mark on the Irish that still resonates today. And we watched him, and it was an amazing moment. It was a hugely inspiring moment for all of us. It mattered enormously, and I think it changed our country in many ways. It let us know that anything was possible. Next time, we explore that historic visit on Let Us Begin.